So we're going to talk about functions. They're probably the most important topic in mathematics today. And actually for the last hundred years. Here we're being asked about a series of graphs, and this is the way you first learned about functions. We're being asked, is this the graph of a function? 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 Of a function? <clears throat> and it's just a yes or no question. And I already have the answers here, so you can see the answer is yes for this, but I need to tell you why, because you won't have the answers uh, when you do your homework. There, that's good. OK, I want the, the color to be red, though. Yeah. Um, the quick and easy, the dirty way to figure out if a graph is the graph of a function is to use the vertical line test. Remember that, and you draw or you imagine drawing a vertical line through the graph. usually at a couple of different points. So like here whoop, and here, you don't have to be careful. All right, here's what the vertical line, line test teaches you. So I'm gonna write vertical line test. Use vertical line test. If this line crosses the graph and touches the graph at only one point everywhere on the graph, then what you've got is a function. And notice that, that no matter where I draw a vertical line here, that vertical line will touch the, uh, the graph at only one point. Heck, it's a function. Yay! <laughs> now, we have a different, a different deal going on with this graph. I've drawn relatively vertical lines through the graph, and notice that my vertical lines touch the graph at two points. Not one, but two. Now, on the other hand, if I had drawn a line through this point, it would say, well, you only intersected the graph at one point, which is why I need multiple points, or at least I need to imagine that I'm drawing vertical lines through more than one point. Because even though if I draw a line here, or if I draw a line here, the vertical line will go through the graph at only one point. Here goes through two. So the answer is no here because the vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. Let's write that down. For people who have come in a little later, we are reviewing. I know that you all already know this, but review is good. Uh, the vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. Let's get technical for a minute. Let's look at this vertical line right here. Right here. Let's see, this point, the point of intersection is the point. Let's see, you go one to the right 
and one, two, three, four, five, six up. So this is the point one six. And it um, it matches up with one on the X axis and six on the Y axis. In mathematics, we talk about mapping. What functions do is they map. Functions map. X coordinates to Y coordinates. Um, this particular PDF editor is hard to write on. Um, the one that I'll, I'll use for the next homework set is uh, neater, much neater, much easier to read. Um, OK, so over here, the number one on the X axis is being mapped to the number six. Let me make this much bigger. One is being mapped to six and where the mapping occurs is right here at this point, one, six. OK, over here. One, two, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. This is negative six on the X axis. One, two, three. This is three on the Y axis. So this point, see, look at that six. That is a sick six. Oh, good. All right. Let's try that again. Six. OK. That makes this point negative six, three. which means the number negative six is being mapped to three at that point right there. And it's the function, the graph, that's doing it. There's no confusion. Negative six is definitely being mapped to three. Positive one is definitely being mapped to six. I know exactly where number one goes, I know exactly where negative six goes. Now, and that makes a function. Come over here. Here's one, two. Here's two on the X axis, right here. Two is being mapped to whatever that Y coordinate is up here. Um, let's say it's one, two, three, point eight. Let's call it three point eight, okay? So two is being mapped to three point eight. I just made that up, of course. Need more room. Ah, but two is also being mapped to whatever that number is. Negative one, negative two, negative three. It kind of looks like negative three and a half. So two is being mapped to negative 3.5, which is three and a half. 
Now tell me, where is 2 going? Is it going to 3.8 or is it going to negative 3.5? Where can I find it quickly? That's why this is not a function, because there's confusion about what is happening, where 2 is being mapped. Is it going to New York City or to California? Well, there is absolutely no confusion here. One is being mapped to six, no problem. Down here, I don't know which one to, uh, to say two is being mapped to. It's being mapped to two different Y coordinates at the same time. So it's not a function. That's why, if you were interested. Okay, the rest of this is little math stuff that we're gonna actually do with functions. Which is why it's kind of important to have a function. We're going to evaluate functions. This is called evaluating. It's something we do with functions a lot. Functions are formulas. Evaluate. Okay. Here we have h of x equals 2x. Remember h of x f of x, b of x, z of x, they're all just ways of writing y. So you could just write this y equals 2x. But more and more, you're going to be writing using function notation, and this is called function notation. And remember you say H of X. It doesn't mean that H is being multiplied by X. It means that Y is being calculated for a particular X. All right, and here are the particular X's. What is H that is Y? Y and H are the same thing. What is Y when X is negative four? What is y when x is 17? What is y when x is 29? And or better yet, to what number is negative four being mapped by the function h? To what number is 17 being mapped by the function h? To what number is 29 being mapped by the function h? Here's how you get these answers. H of negative four equals, well, let's write what H of X is first. H of X equals two times X. So H of negative four is two times negative four, which is negative eight. And H of 17. 17 in the parentheses means that 17 gets mapped to that set of parentheses right there. 2 times 17 is 34. That's how they get that answer. Now, H of 29 is two times 29. And so two times nine is 18, carry the one, two times two is four plus one is five. And that's how you get 58. We have evaluated H of X for negative four, for 17, and for 29. Don't you feel good? 
uh, the function a of s given by this function right here can be used to calculate the average age of employees uh, between the years 1981 and 2009. Let A of S be the average age of an employee, they already said that, and S be the number of years since 1981. That is S equals zero for 1981 and S equals nine for 1990. This is a very common way to calculate time. And you're going to see that it's used over and over and over again. We don't use the year, but we state, OK. Our um, our calculation started in 1981. Therefore, 1981 is going to be year zero which makes 1982, which is one year after 1981, it makes that year one. And so on and so forth, 1983 is uh, three, eight, three, 1983 is two years after 1981, so it becomes year two. And since in this problem, the author of the problem has decided to use the letter S to mean years after 1981, when the study started, uh, that's how we get S equals zero for 1981, S equals one, for 1982, S equals 2. For 1983, and then they go ahead and they tell us that 1990, using that system, is going to be year 9, which is S equals 9. Cool. Now, the average age of employees in 2003 is, and we're not supposed to know these, So here's how you figure it out. 2003 is going to equal, well, 2003, let me change the equals to a minus. 2003 minus the start year 1981 is going to be, well, um, get your calculator and say 2003 minus 1981, whoa, 2003 minus 1981. It's 22 years. Cool. Is going to be year 22. Which means we'll have S equals 22. So what does that mean for us? That means that this first question is going to be calculated by putting this in my calculator 0 0.295 times 22 plus 58. Okay. So 0 0.295 times 22 plus 58. Let me make sure that's right. I don't trust myself. 0 0.295, yes, times 22 plus 58. And there it is right there. That's the time symbol. It's what you get when you click on times. 64.49. Ah. 
How did they get 64? Because there are instructions here also. You have to be sure to read those instructions or you'll get the problem wrong. If I had answered 64.49 and put that into my math lab, it would have said I was wrong. And why would I have been wrong? Because I didn't read the other instructions. There are instructions usually in two different places in my math lab. You have them on top, which are the general instructions, and then you have them underneath each answer box. So round to the nearest whole number as needed. Ah, you're going to have to round. OK, well, let's look at 64.49. Here's the whole number part. The number immediately to the right of that is a four. A four is not large enough to round up this four to a five. Therefore, I just drop off the 49 and my answer is 64. You're going to have to remember your rounding rules you're going to be rounding a lot and people lose lots of points on tests by not rounding correctly. At college algebra, you're expected to know how to round. Not in pre-algebra, but now after all these years of math, yes, you got to be able to round. OK, now enough of that. OK, now we're going to look at the average age of employees in 2009. 2009. Minus 1981. Whoop. 1981. Equals. Two zero zero nine minus nineteen eighty one. Well, that gives me a nice round twenty eight. Ah, right, duh. That's going to be S equals twenty eight. So I come over here zero point two nine. 5 times 28 plus 58. So 0 0.295 times 28 plus 58. Make sure that's right. Yeah, so there it is larger, it's down here. And I'm going to hit enter. And I get 66.26. .26. This says the same thing, round to the nearest whole number, 66.26. .26. Here's the whole number part. The, uh, the decimal expansion is what it's called. This is the fraction part. 66 is your whole number part. You look over at the two. Two is not large enough to make six go up to a seven, so your answer is 66. Now, what number would have made 66 go up to 67? And the answer is if this number had been five, six, seven, eight or nine that would have caused 66 to be 67 but it wasn't so it didn't okay the thing you want to learn from this is yeah yeah you're going to have to round but in particular in grown-up math in science and in business. 
most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, years are calculated like this, like this, where 2009 is really year 28, which means you have to know what year you started with. Okay, so you will get used to this as we go through the semester. Use the graph to find the following. Okay. And then it's going to ask us about the domain. So f of zero equals what? Remember, this is the question. I printed this with all the answers, but you don't know this going into it. f of zero. This is always going to be the x coordinate. This is going to be the x coordinate where the graph is when you're asking about the y coordinate. So we go to x equals zero, which is right here, right? This is two, this is one, this is zero, this is negative one, x equals negative one. So this is x equals zero right here, right in the center. What this question is asking you is what is y when x is zero? So you go to the point on the graph at x equals zero and you say, oh, well, well, y is zero there. In fact, at the very center called the origin, x is zero and y is zero. But you can tell just by looking y equals zero at every point on the x-axis. And then here y is one, y is two, y is three, y is four. So f of zero equals zero for this particular graph. It's not always going to be true. Now, what is the domain? The domain is always left to right. It's not the up or down. Range is the up or down. Actually, it goes down to up lowest to highest, but I'm not trying to be official right now. Down to up. OK. So I could say this graph goes up forever and down forever, and I can tell by the, the arrows. However, if I'm being asked about domain, I don't care what it's doing up or down. I care about left to right. Notice that as this graph goes mostly up, it's also tilting out to the right, and that's going to keep going forever and ever and ever. And as the graph is going down, it's also tilting out to the left. So eventually, this graph is going to match up with every point, every point on the x-axis the entire x-axis is going to be its domain. And remember that the x-axis goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So we come back over here. <clears throat> Again, it says all real numbers. You've only got real numbers on the x-axis. You've only got real numbers on the y-axis. Is there any such thing as unreal numbers? Yes, you learned about that in Algebra 2, in Intermediate Algebra, the I numbers. OK, the complex number system. But our graphs 
are in the real number system. And so the only numbers you're going to see on either the X or the Y axes are real numbers. So since this graph goes to the left forever and the right forever, I can safely say the domain is all real numbers. But what that means is the entire X axis which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity. There are different ways to write these things. Now it says find all of the X values such that F of X equals two. What are they saying? What they're saying is, forget f of x, they're saying y equals two. If y equals two, what x values is that true for? Oh no, let's look. All right, they want y equals two. Here's y equals two. If I draw a horizontal line through y equals 2. I intersect the graph at this point. So let me see what x coordinate that matches up with. It's 2. x equals 2. OK, so y equals 2 matches up with x equals 2. And that's what we have here. That's how they got that answer. And that is the meaning of an ordered pair. Points are called ordered pairs. And so they're written like this, where you've got an X number and then a comma and a Y number. So Y is the number that you get on the Y axis when X is a certain number and the other way around. So here what 2, 2 means is that if Y is 2, X is 2. If X is 2, Y is 2. What is the range? The range goes lowest to highest. Well, this graph goes up forever and down forever. It's going to cover the entire Y axis. So it's all the real numbers again. The entire y axis which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity but it's a different negative infinity to positive infinity from the uh, from the x axis this is the y axis OK, and you have more of these, but let's do this because it's a little more complicated. This is the graph of the absolute value, just so you know. You're going to see it. This is the graph of y equals the absolute value of x, but it's shifted. OK, so use the graph to find the following. What is f of 2? What that means is you go to 2 on the x-axis. 
you go up to the graph. And then over to the Y axis. And you get four. So F of two is four. And what that means is you've got the point two four on your graph. This is the point two four. Okay, what's the domain? This graph goes to the left forever and to the right forever. So the entire X axis is the domain. In other words, the domain is all real numbers. The entire X axis. which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity. Now it says for what X values is F of X equal to one? F of X equal to one. What is that? Oh, for what X values is Y equal to one? What we do is we go to Y equals one, which is right here, and draw a horizontal line. Notice there are two numbers on the x-axis that match up with y equals 1. Here, 5. And here, 7. Which means this is the point 5, 7, and this is the point, uh, I mean, this is the point 5, 1. And this is the point seven one. I don't really have room to write it. Maybe I do. Five one. Seven one. So that's why the answer is five and seven. Notice how they write it. They don't put parentheses around it. That would say you've got a point, the point five, seven. That would be totally wrong. You're listing the X coordinates that match up with the Y coordinate one. And what is the range it's asking? Aha, now. This graph does not go down forever. It only goes down as far as the X axis, and then it starts going back up. So the part of the, of the Y axis that is the source for all the Y coordinates of all the points on the graph, the range, starts at y equals zero, which is what the x-axis is, and then goes up forever. So there are two ways to write it. The most customary way to write this range would be interval no notation, which would be bracket, zero because y actually equals zero to positive infinity. However, 
what we have over here is the other way. The other way to write um, 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 domain and range or any kind of interval and that is set builder notation. That's what this is called. OK, so um, it's not all real numbers. Instead, you're going to have Y equal to or greater than zero because in this graph, Y is equal to zero or all numbers greater than zero. But no negative numbers, which is why the answer is not all real numbers. Oh, it just keeps going on. All right, but we are only going to do one more. Maybe two more. Just real fast, what is the domain of this function? Rule, very important rule. The denominator of a function cannot equal zero. Here you've got the denominator of a function. You have to make sure it doesn't equal zero. So X minus two cannot equal zero. Well, solve this just like you would solve a regular equation. Add two to both sides. Negative two plus two is zero. You're left with an X on the left, not equal to positive two. You could do this in your head, by the way. What number for X will make X minus two equals zero. You could just look at that and say, well, if X is two, you're gonna have two minus two, which is zero. That means X can never be allowed to equal two if you're working with this function. So, we pick. X can be any real number except two. Two is the only troublemaker. So that's why this is the answer right here. X can equal zero. If X is zero, you'll have zero minus two, which is negative two. There's nothing wrong with the number negative two. It's the whole denominator, X minus two, that cannot equal zero. OK, one more, one more, and then we take a quick break. And go on to the rest of the homework. So again, we have a denominator that could equal zero. We have to guard against it being zero. Why? Because it says find the domain. Hello. Find the domain. Okay, X minus seven X is the denominator and it cannot equal zero. So eight minus seven uh, X cannot equal zero. I will solve this by adding seven X to both sides. Negative 7x plus 7x is 0. 
that leaves me with an eight cannot equal seven X. Zero plus seven X is seven X. Now to solve for X, this is seven times X. I have to do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. Seven over seven cancels. And I'm left with X equals eight. X cannot equal eight sevenths. So now we start reading these. Uh, X is a real number and X cannot equal zero. What would happen if X was zero? You'd have eight minus zero. Seven times zero is zero. You'd have eight minus zero, which is eight. No problem, so this is not correct. X can, uh, X can only be numbers greater than eight sevenths. What about negative two? I mean, that would be positive 14. Eight plus 14 would be 22. You'd have three over 22. Nothing wrong with that, so this won't work. Where do they get three? Good grief. Now, this is your answer right here. X is all real numbers, or X is a real number, a number on the X axis, but not, definitely not eight sevenths which is what we got here. 